it amounts to. So they deny the atonement of Jesus Christ because uh, the material is evil. Our goal is to reach a, a spiritual state, an unembodied spiritual state. But also, because of that, they would deny the second coming of Jesus. And you go to chapter 3, verse 4, and he says, Hey, in the last days, mockers are going to come with their mocking and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Jesus is not coming back. He was just a man. He's dead. Right? And that could be, not 100% positive, but very well could be what Peter is writing against at this time. And then also... It explains Peter's focus on true knowledge. Gnosticism is from the word gnosis, the Greek word gnosis, meaning to know. And what they believed is that they were special people who had access to the real truth, and only certain special people could get there. And so you had to be one of the initiated to be able to access this Knowledge. Well, Peter comes along and says, no, you've received, received the same kind of faith as we have through the true knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. And he time and time again addresses this idea of knowledge, of knowing the truth. And we'll look at that in more detail, but that's why he focuses on true knowledge. Let's look at it just real quickly because we're running, going to run out of time. But can you see that? Oh, yeah, you see that really good because it's really small on my screen. We see a, a comparison of First and Second Peter. First of all, First Peter was written to explain to them or to warn them against external opposition. In other words, persecution. Second Peter is written to uh, warn them about internal opposition. In other words, false teachers. First Peter addresses suffering. Second Peter addresses error in the church. First Peter uh, gives them hope, is written to give them hope. Second Peter is to give them knowledge that they need to be prepared. First Peter is written to encourage. Second Peter is written to expose false teachers. First Peter is written to comfort. Second Peter is written to caution. First Peter is written to prompt them to holiness. Second Peter is written to prompt them to maturity. First Peter is written uh, to, to deal with the fact that there is purpose in their pain, whereas Second Peter is writing about poison in the pew. First Peter is written to exemplify the suffering of Jesus Christ. Second Peter is writing to tell to remind them of the return of Jesus Christ. And then finally, uh, First Peter we find similarities to Paul's writings, for instance, in Ephesians and Second Peter we find similarities to Jude's writing. All right, so why is it that Peter is writing 2 Peter? Very simply. I, I like the way Dr. Cohn put it. He says, Peter is concerned with their ability to maintain diligence in, accordings, in accordance with true knowledge and their preparedness to avoid the false teaching that had risen. Chapter 3, verse 1 through, uh, through 7 he warns them of these false teachers and he's telling them you have to remember what was spoken beforehand by the prophets. What prophets? The Old Testament prophets. He points them back to the Old Testament prophets speaking of the coming Messiah. Um, and then he says also the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then he goes on and says, and by your apostles. In other words, all these things written by the prophets, those spoken by Jesus Christ himself, and the apostles of Jesus Christ. You need to remember all of this because there are coming these people who are going to mock the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sound familiar? There's a whole several uh, branches of Christianity, evangelical Christians, who uh, mock this idea of the rapture of the church, who mock this idea that the church is not the kingdom of God, but we are awaiting the kingdom of God. And it's, we're mocked and we're vilified. Matter of fact, in our particular belief system, uh, as dispensationalists, as some of you are saying, is there a cure for that? Uh, as dispensationalists, some people accuse us of being the reason the United States is in the turmoil it's in, because we are believing that the, God's, uh, the Lord Jesus is going to come rescue us and we're not concerned with this culture at all. We'll deal with that someday. But what Peter is wanting them to be firm in their understanding of the truth so that when these mockers come and begin to mock them for their belief 
in the return of Jesus Christ, they can stand firm without their faith wavering. Paul Benoit puts it like this. He says, Peter wrote to emphasize the necessity of being knowledgeable in order to mature in Christ and in order to avoid the doctrinal and practical errors of false teaching. And we can see those errors all around us in the church. Okay? So, just remember, as we begin to go through 2 Peter, Peter focuses on the knowledge necessary to mature in Christ and to stand firm in your faith. And it still, to this day, it baffles my mind, uh, or baffles me, as to why somehow in the Christian church we, have, we, we, we seem to think that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, bang, everything, everything's, we just know it all. We, we know how to be Christians. And we don't train our people to become Christ-like in their thinking and in their actions and in their words. And like me, I grew up not knowing. I just didn't know. I had those foundational beliefs, and that was it. I didn't know I was supposed to get in the Word. I didn't know that if, you know, it's like becoming a doctor, if I want to become a, a medical doctor, guess what? Do I make that decision, okay, I'm going to become a medical doctor, and that, there I can go start my practice? Not even, right? You laugh at that. But we don't laugh at the other side. I'm a Christian. And so now I can go be a pastor. You know how many people I knew that did stuff like that? Become a Christian one day and by in two months they're pastoring a church. They don't even know how to be a Christian yet. How are they going to shepherd God's flock? Get off my soapbox here. There are some unique features to 2 Peter. And very quickly we'll look through these. First of all is that focus on the knowledge uh, the knowledge needed for holy living and the knowledge needed to prepare to stand against the false teachers. Also, uh, Second Peter presents uh, one of the classic statements describing the inspiration of Scripture. In other words, we go to Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, 16 and 17. That's one of those strong statements on the inspiration of Scripture. But also, here in Second uh, Peter uh, chapter 1, 19 through 21 is another classic statement a pronouncement of the uh, inspiration of Scripture. In verse 19, he says, So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. And we're going to dig into that when we get, when we get there. The third thing that's unique is that it's the only New Testament book that records how the current creation will be destroyed. And we find that in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, that, that God is going to destroy the current heavens and the earth with fire. Okay? And then finally... His focus on remembrance that's completely in line with his focus on knowledge. If you're like me, I have a lot of knowledge. I just can't remember any of it. Right? And Peter's saying, look, you have to remember. Re bring that back to mind, what you've been taught in the past. All right, so very quickly, we'll be done in just a moment, but we want to look at the structure. What is the outline? What is the structure of 2 Timothy. Now, this is really, this is somewhat subjective. I originally had made my outline in four major points and then went back and looked at uh, my outline and didn't like it. And then I looked at some other things uh, and, and changed my outline. But this is how I come, I come down on this. It's a threefold division, all right? Uh, it's great because it goes chapter by chapter. Uh, chapter one, we find diligence based on, the true, on true knowledge. And it's divided into two subpoints. First of all, is the uh, truth and uh, and Christian growth, and then truth and historical reliability. Is the word of God historically reliable? The second major division, chapter two, diligence against false knowledge, and then that has three subdivisions: the impending presence of false teachers, the judgment on false teachers, and the characteristics of false teachers. 
And then finally, in chapter 3, we see diligence in holiness based on true knowledge. And so the two subdivisions are knowledge of Christ's return and knowledge of holy conduct. Now, I know some of you are feverishly trying to write all this down. Good luck with that. Um, we'll get back to it. Okay. So if you don't get it all today, don't worry about it. It may be up on the Internet sometime this week um, where you can see the outline for yourself. All right? So let's end with this. What we find in the book of Peter is the centrality of diligence, but a diligence that is based on true knowledge. I'm going to continue using that true knowledge. It's from the word epinosis. Gnosis means knowledge. When you put that prefix epi on there, it intensifies what's meant by the word. And we'll deal with that. But the English here in my New American Standard translates it as true knowledge. Okay? And so I'm going to stick with that. But Peter is really focusing on diligence based on true knowledge. And I want to close with this quote from Dr. Ben Ware. And, and this is very significant. Everything, again, there's that word. He uses it in, in chapter uh, 1, verse 3. Everything. Believers need to live godly lives and avoid the corrupting influences of this world system has been provided. Peter goes on and tells us that it's been provided through true knowledge of him. And then he goes on and speaks of the fact that the Old Testament prophecies have been made even more sure to us. And what he's doing is he's building his case that it is the word of God alone. Let me restate that. The word of God alone is where we find the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is the only source we can go to to grow in regards to our salvation. In other words, we don't sit around waiting for a new message from God. We don't wake up in the morning, get in the shower, and think, oh, God spoke to me this morning while I was in the shower. I was, I was under my right armpit, as Dr. Couch used to say. And all of a sudden, a shaft of light. It is the Word of God as found in the pages of Scripture is our only source. And Peter directs us back to that. So it's all been provided. The true knowledge of God and His ways will produce the excellent virtues of the Christian life, which Peter calls uh, being partakers of the divine nature. In other words, we go to the words of Scripture, that is the, the truth that has been provided for us in order that we might become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, the outworking of the holiness of Jesus Christ in our lives finds its... its fertilizer, if you will, in God's Word. And without the faithful and deep study of the Word of God, we will remain spiritual babies, spiritually immature. So, of course, then my recommendation would be we need to get in the Word of God. And again, I'm, I'll offer this. If, if, some, if some of you here want to... to do some study on how to study scripture, let me know and we'll work on that. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word and we pray, Lord, that we handle it correctly for only in your word do we find the essentials for life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and it is not until we begin to know and understand you as you have revealed to us in your word that we can have the true fear of you based upon the knowledge that you give to us. And only then can we begin to uh, experience the wisdom and the truth that you provide. So Father, help us to be faithful students of your word. And I pray for each member of the family here at Cornerstone Bible Church that we would be faithful uh, students of your word, that we might grow in regards to our salvation, that we would grow to maturity in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.